So this is the social media lecture, um, and this one is very long. So I've created um, little links here that you can use to jump ahead to farther parts in the, um, in the lecture. So if you're really familiar with Twitter or YouTube and you want to learn more about Reddit or Snapchat, um, you can use these to kind of jump ahead. So when you come back and refer back to this lecture later, know that you could use these um, to kind of help jump ahead a little bit. Um, let's scroll down. This is just kind of like a silly little graphic that explains the differences between all of the platforms. Um, it's kind of a little joke, but it actually I think is kind of helpful. Um, the biggest ones that we're going to be looking at, um, especially today, uh, we're going to look at Twitter first, and then we're going to look at Facebook as well. Instagram is also a really big one. LinkedIn, Pinterest, um, and, and Google+. Plus. Um, so I'm going to go over these um, just so you can kind of see an overview of the difference, and then we're going to go in depth on how you can use all of these uh, for yourself and also how you could use them for reporting, for journalism, if you end up working in broadcast news, um, how all of these social platforms can help you. Um, so Facebook is actually the one that sends the most web traffic, um, referral traffic than any other social media um, network. This is the biggest one. More people in the entire world use Facebook than any other social media platform. Um, Twitter is uh, views itself more as a news platform. So a lot of journalists are on Twitter. A lot of news organizations are posting on Twitter. Twitter is a fantastic resource for you to stay up to date on news. And I'm going to show you guys a couple of tools today like TweetDeck that will help you consume news more efficiently. Twitter is for retweeting and curating. Um, that's most of the time I'm retweeting often or I'm, I'm just sharing something on Twitter. Um, I don't oftentimes write my own tweets. Um, I tweet a, often, I tweet a lot every day, but most of the time it's me sharing an article that's already been written. Um, if you are a reporter at a TV news station, your boss will likely give you like a minimum number of tweets you have to write per day. So they'll say you have to write a certain number of original tweets um, that you actually create from scratch. So like the ones that you guys are doing of Florida Focus, for example, hey, look at me, I'm running the teleprompter for Florida Focus today, check out our show later this afternoon. Those are all original tweets. Those aren't considered retweets or curated tweets. Um, this is really great too to share your blog um, to promote website content. So I encourage you guys as you post your blogs and now that you guys are working on your blog posts, um, go ahead and share those on Twitter. That's a really good platform for you guys to start um, promoting yourself share your brand, and it's also a platform where people are looking for content like that. Um, I encourage all of you to get a LinkedIn profile. If you don't already have one, please create a LinkedIn profile. Um, LinkedIn is really helpful for getting a job, um, for networking, um, and for kind of understanding um, more professional news, what's happening in your field. Um, People will look at your LinkedIn profile before they hire you. Um, there are also lots of recruiters on LinkedIn. So um, this is a fantastic resource. If you put yourself out there, you can mark on LinkedIn that you're currently looking for a job or an internship opportunity, for example, and then recruiters will target you based on the keywords that you use in your profile. So LinkedIn is fantastic. If you don't have it, please create one. There are, um, you can pay for like premium accounts, but the free ones work perfectly fine and we'll look at like how you can use that to get a job later in this lecture. Um, Instagram is very visual. Um, that's really for images, for videos. Um, it's not the best right now for driving blog traffic because they don't hyperlink URLs very well in the posts, but um, it is great for like promoting visual brands and, um, and for kind of getting to know people on more of a personal level than like let's say Twitter for example or LinkedIn. Um, Pinterest is great for things like recipes um, that's huge on pinterest um, if you are interested in renovating a house you'll find a million boards that you can pin to or, or post that you could pin on your board and save them for later um, this is just a really cool resource that as a reporter you could use depending on what type of topics you um, tend to cover so like if you have a very 
like let's say food is your beat and you have a super fun beat as a reporter you could be sharing lots of things on your boards and then pushing your um, viewers or your readers to go to your pinterest and and share and, and interact on pinterest i really like pinterest a lot um, i mainly use it for like recipes and stuff because there's lots of those on there but it has grown from that to become very like like tools that journalists can use. And we have another lecture for infographics where I've embedded a Pinterest list. Um, so Pinterest is also very helpful um, if you like the way that it's like laid out. Um, I, I think it's really great. Google Plus, so raise your hand if you have a Google Plus account. Raise your hand if you have a Gmail. You all have a Google Plus account. <laughs> so very few people realize because Google Plus didn't really take off as much as everybody wanted it to. But if you have a Gmail, you're into Google's world, you're attached there. So like the same way as you can get a YouTube account, all those things that are attached to um, Google, um, you actually have this already. So you might want to log in and just check what's on your Google Plus account. So it may have been posting for you already and you don't even know um, because it's tied with a lot of your things. So if you're sharing videos on YouTube, for example, it might automatically be shared on your Google Plus account. Um, so just check it. Um, I don't think it's used as often in America. I know my friends in Europe do a lot of Google circles, Google Plus circles and things like that. Um, I don't think it's a big deal to like really use. I don't think it's going to hurt you if you don't use it. But it is interesting to like know what it is and you want to make sure that what you have on your Google Plus account um, is, is intentional. So just check it out today. Log in and see what, if you have one, uh, you might and you might not even know it. That's one of the, the bummers about Google Plus. It just didn't take off the way that they were hoping. Um, but it is huge because lots of people have um, Gmails and YouTubes, um, YouTube accounts. So some of the social media terms that are important for you guys to understand, um, microblogging. So microblogging has taken off in the past 10 years. Um, blogs like the ones that you guys are writing used to be these really long things and now we've, we've really condensed them to tweets, Facebook posts, those are all considered microblogs. Um, and if you want to check like Facebook statuses, there's hyperlinks throughout this entire um, lecture that you could read more about all of these things if you're interested in them. Um, next up is memes and GIFs. So a meme is basically taking a viral concept and making them everyday lingo. So you'll see lots of pictures that have funny text on them. Um, that's basically a meme. If you click know your meme, you'll find a ton of meme examples. Um, they're similar to, to GIFs. I call them GIFs, but technically you should know that it's really called GIF, which is a big debate, but it is actually pronounced GIF. But because everyone calls it a GIF, I just call it a GIF. I feel like that's more normal. But know that if you're talking to like a hardcore like person about accuracy, it really should be GIF. That's how it's pronounced. But GIFs are um, graphics interchange format. Those are those fun, like little tiny clips of movies or TV shows um, that you share on Twitter or in texts. Um, both memes and GIFs are important to understand because the legal language around them is changing a lot. Um, like the New York court recently, um, it was about a month ago, they, they voted against uh, several companies that had been embedding GIFs and memes that they were violating copyright laws. So we'll see what happens with that. It's likely to be overturned, but there's definitely, definitely going to be a legal battle surrounding memes and GIFs in the coming years, because right now we consider them going through the loophole of um, like you're recreating something, but technically if you're creating a GIF or a meme out of something that you don't own, like a TV show or a movie, that is really their property, the property of the people who own the TV shows or the movies. So um, right now it's, it's fair to use them, um, but it's something to keep an eye on. It's something to understand that this might change um, as we move forward because it's so new, laws take time to catch up and perhaps the future of these is celebrities making and selling their own uh, or something like that. So just know that these things might change over the next couple of years, but for now it's kind of like a free for all a little bit. Um, engagement is a huge word that you're gonna hear if you work in a newsroom. Your engagement numbers, your analytics are massively important now. So how you engage with people online um, is becoming a part of your brand and that's something that you can use to sell yourself, um, to promote yourself and to hopefully um, get better jobs and get paid more at your job. 
Um, so an important thing that you should start doing now, don't just post information on social media, really engage with people. Part of that is tagging people, part of it is commenting. That'll also boost your number of followers and it'll make your analytics look a lot better. Um, one of the things that you could do to really help your engagement and really help the balance of your online brand um, is following the 80-20 rule. So the 80-20 rule means that 80% of the content you post should be something that's of value to your community. Not just like, I ate pizza today, or, oh gosh, I'm so tired, I need more coffee, right? None of that helps anybody. It's just you're just sharing random things about yourself. Um, social media has transformed drastically, so even though that was probably more popular when it first started like 10 years ago or so, um, that's becoming less acceptable if you um, want to try using social media like an hour field to get a job. So that's really something you should be looking at as more of a professional tool than something just to kind of like rant on. So 80% um, so of your posts should actually be of value to people who follow you or people you hope will follow you, and then the other 20% can be self-promoting. Um, so for example, you posted a blog post this week um, and you want to tell people to go read it, that's something you can share that will promote something you wrote, or you made a video that you want people to watch and you're gonna share your YouTube link, um, that's self-promoting. So you wanna have that balance so that your followers don't feel like you're only trying to like push yourself on them. You want them to feel like following you provides some value to them. So like if you look at my um, Twitter account, for example, I try really hard to do this where um, I will post a lot of stuff that I think is valuable for you guys. So you guys are kind of my target audience now since I'm a teacher, my students and my coworkers are my target demo. So here's a great internship opportunity. The deadline is March 14th and I've embedded the link where you can apply. Here's another thing that you can apply for if you're interested in data journalism. Want to make money on the side? Here are 26 legitimate side hustles. And then this one is kind of a combination of self-promoting. Um, I was thanking Rod Carter for um, tweeting out a picture of two of my students. He invited them to shadow him at News Channel 8 yesterday. So that's kind of self-promoting. Um, so like 80% of my tweets, if you look at all of these that are like valuable for you guys, um, and then this would be like one of the self-promoting ones kind of, because I'm promoting our connection with somebody who is a really great asset to our school. Uh, but the rest of these, like if you look at all of these, they're like valuable news information uh, or I'm promoting like other student work, stuff like that. So you should really try to follow that 80-20 rule um, to make it more likely that people feel like it's valuable for them to follow you. Um, RT, that's a retweet. DM, that's a private direct message on Twitter. So if somebody says just DM me, that means message me on Twitter. Don't post on my timeline. Um, so this little symbol here, the at sign, that always goes in front of a Twitter user's handle. Um, so like if you look at my handle, for example, you'll see everybody's handles um, up underneath their name. This is my handle. If you want to tag somebody in a tweet, you'd use that at um, signal or the at symbol immediately before their username. So don't do at and then space. I've seen people do that when they tweet and then it doesn't link to the person's account so they don't get a notification that you've just tried to tag them on Twitter. Um, so the last one is hashtag. Hashtags are used a lot nowadays, but they were kind of misunderstood when they first came out. They really have a tremendous ability to like uh, become searchable for you. So if you're working at a news organization and you want your viewers to like engage on something, if you tell them to like use a hashtag, um, and then you can curate a lot of their tweets. You can create like your socially generated content from your viewers and share that that way. Um, one example, like when my husband and I got married, we had little signs up of what our hashtag was and I'd searched the hashtag before we used it to see if anybody else was using it and they, and weirdly they hadn't, but it was just Jeanette and Nelson. And so everybody who took a picture um, uh, or a video of our wedding just hashtag Jeanette Nelson so I can go back at any time, search the hashtag, and there are all the pictures everybody took. So they don't have to email it to me. They don't have to text it to me. It's just curated online with hashtags. Um, and this is just kind of like a silly little video that I will play so that you don't have to listen to me talk the whole time um, and to hopefully remind you of like what hashtags are, remind you to use hashtags 
um, in your tweets, your Facebook posts, your Instagram um, posts, your LinkedIn posts. Use hashtags um, because they are important at driving engagement and making it look like you know what you're talking about on social media. But this is just kind of a silly little parody video so that I will stop talking for a second. Hey, Jessica, what's up? How much do you hashtag Jones? So we can be working, hashtag rising, rising, hashtag is it Hey, you know, where is the Okay, so you have no excuse now from now on to not use a hashtag in every post that you make. Please use hashtags. They are super powerful. Lots of different types of hashtags. Um, there are daily hashtags that trend, like days of the week hashtags. So like when you see a second here, I know the hashtag Monday motivation. Here we go. That always pops up every Monday. Hashtag Monday motivation. Every day of the week has different hashtags. And if you really want to um, boost your search engine optimization, you really want to make sure that people see uh, what you're doing, um, then you should use these trending hashtags. It's also helpful if you are trying to do um, something with like social movements. Black Lives Matter, for example, really exploded because of their hashtag use. Um, the more people who use that hashtag, the more likely it is to trend, the more likely it is for it to be um, in the top of your newsfeed and for news organizations to pick it up and comment on the fact that it's trending. Um, there are lots of social media guidelines. Um, depending on where you work, you'll have different guidelines. Um, this one here, I encourage you to read on your own time. It's from NPR and, and I think it tends to be the most objective um, and it tends to be the safest one. So it basically explains like um, if you are going to apply for the internship, the deadline is March 14th, um, then you should take a look at their social media guidelines because it helps you understand what can you post, what can you not post, what type of wording should you be using. Um, there's a whole list of things that you need to be paying attention to because you now represent the company you work for, even if as an intern. You can't intern at NPR and be posting Donald Trump sucks then you will lose your internship because it's not objective. So you wanna make sure that you're following the guidelines so that you don't hurt yourself because you guys are investing a lot of time and money studying, trying to get a degree, and you don't want the comments that you make on social media to reflect badly upon you and to make people think that you're a liability so they don't wanna hire you or give you an uh, opportunity to intern because of what you post on social media. Um, so t take a look at this here. Um, the one thing that I would say, and I've looked through a lot of students' social media accounts for them, so if you're if you're not sure how you're doing and you want me to take a look at it, I'm happy to just give you feedback on like, yeah, maybe you need to delete like half of this. Um, my boss did that for me before I was promoted to be a manager. He's like, okay, let's sit down. Let's look through everything you've ever posted on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. And it was like, I it blew my mind because I didn't realize, and I think nowadays, it's changed a little than it than it back back in the day it was more we thought it was private it wasn't but we thought like it was almost like MySpace where it was like my online 
journal almost like that's how we treated it kind of back in the day and now it really is a platform for your professional identity so like anything that you have that's inappropriate um, anything that you think might jeopardize um, an opportunity just think about is this post that I'm about to tweet or you know Facebook out or whatever or if you look back are the past posts that you've made are they helping your chances of getting a job and if the answer is no just delete it don't even take the risk um just delete it and i had to go through and i cleanse out my feeds all the time um, and i try not to post anything that would hurt me but because a lot of us have had social media accounts for like 10 years you want to go back and look through like everything you've ever posted um, and really clean up your accounts before you start applying for jobs um social media is incredibly powerful when it comes to reaching your customers and reaching um, your audience. So please take a minute um, after class to read this Pew Research Center analysis. Every year they do this, news use across social media platforms. This is the most recent one from 2017. Um, and it, this is like, I think one of the most important ones, but they go through and do a ton of research on who's using different platforms. So if you have a story or a video or uh, something that you are trying to share and you know that your target demographic is let's say 25 year old males, then what social media platform are you gonna use to really boost your chances of them um, looking at your content or finding it? Um, or for example, if you have a story about retirement benefits, where is it going to be more um, return on your investment. If you post on a certain platform, if you focus on, uh, it may be paying to boost your things. You don't have to do that, but you can pay to boost your posts um, on Facebook, for example. Um, so this is just kind of interesting to kind of just to understand that on Facebook, 62% of the users are female. That's a lot, that's a big difference. Whereas YouTube has a larger majority of male users than female users. There are more men who use Twitter than females. There are more females who use Instagram than men. More females who use Snapchat. And then there are actually more males who use LinkedIn. So just interesting pieces of information for you to take into consideration when you're posting. Um, and then looking at your age range. This is kind of not surprising, but take a look at Snapchat. I mean, 82% of Snapchat users are between the ages of 18 and 29. So if you're trying to promote something that like let's say 401k retirement um something social security benefits or whatever then this is not the platform you will use to reach your target demo or vice versa if you have um you know a story that's that's targeting this age group you really want to maybe understand what snapchat is um that's for a company but it's also for uh news organizations it's for your own stories um, so it's important to kind of be familiar with this. Um, they have lots other lots of other ones. Just understanding um, why you would use social media for for reporting. Um, it's just super helpful to understand like Facebook, for example, forty five percent of people who are on Facebook get news on that site. That's a lot. That's a lot a lot. So sixty six percent of u s. adults who were who were part of this study, um, use Facebook, YouTube, way fewer, like way smaller ratio of news users to overall users. But then you look at Twitter's ratio. That's a lot of people who are on Twitter for news. So Twitter is a really good platform for you guys to use if you're trying to share news stories. Um, and all of these kind of change every year, but this is the most current, most recent one. Um, Twitter, YouTube, and, and Snapchat have grown since 2016. Um, and then you can kind of take a look at the others and how they're changing. If you are brand new to Twitter and you really want like a ground up, how do I do Twitter? This is a cool tutorial just for beginners to show you. Um, I'm going to assume that most of you have, have accounts by now. And now I want to make sure that you are really using them to their fullest uh, potential. So um, Mashable has a really good link um, here. If you click on this, it's a guidebook to Twitter. So just to help you increase your engagement and boost your search engine optimization. Um, now we're going to take a look at Twitter bios. Um, this is a really great link here that'll that'll walk you through some Twitter bio ideas. Um, this link also posted this interesting um, tidbit here that I added. 
that um, social media drives 31% of website web referrals. So you also want to add your website in there. So the blogs or your YouTube channels, you want to make sure you put that on Twitter. So like, let's take a look at my profile and my bio and then look at how I use um, my, my hashtags or my handles and, um, and my website. So this is the actual Twitter bio. You want to make sure that your bio includes key searchable words so that people can find you on Twitter. So if they're looking to like follow you, what are they going to be searching for? Student at the University of South Florida, for example. And then make sure that you use handles in your bio that'll boost your credibility and make it more engaging um, and make it easier to find you also. So for me, the most important information needs to go first. So the most relevant thing is that I'm a visiting instructor at the University of South Florida. Here's another keyword, TV news, broadcast news, reporting. Those are, those are all searchable keywords. And then I also put the handle for our actual college inside of the university. Uh, multimedia producer, those are extra keywords, journalist. And then I put something personal that's also a little memorable because most people who I know know that I'm not from here, I'm from Norway. So the Norwegian keyword is something that's important to me. And it helps because other Norwegians who are in America, like it's such a small group of people that we like band together. So like generally, if I see somebody else who's Norwegian on Twitter, I'll be like, oh, hey, and I might not even have anything in common with them. But just because they're Norwegian, I'm more likely to follow them back. Um, so if you have other things like that, other things in common, sports teams or things that are important to you, you can add those two at the bottom. Um, and then I put my location. I think location is super, super important, especially for companies, but also like if you're looking for a job in the area, I'm also much more likely to follow somebody back if I can see, oh, they're from Tampa. Oh, maybe I know them, I'll follow them back. Um, so I put my link here to my website um, and I don't think it matters. You don't need to put your birthday. I just put it because I don't really mind. Um, but so this is a Twitter bio. And then we're going to scroll down in a second and look at some other examples of Twitter bios. But make sure that you have it filled out, that you put something in your bio. Don't leave it blank. Um, you can be clever and funny, um, but those keywords are also really important. So don't forget keywords in your bio. Twitter search is super awesome and helpful if you are especially a reporter. I really like the advanced search that you can go and search through like, okay, who's tweeting about this? What are the keywords? I've used this to find my own tweets that I've sent out in the past. So I'm like, I remember reading an article and I almost always share articles that I read on Twitter. So if I read something that I thought was interesting, I'm gonna tweet about it. And then if I think, God, what was that article that I wrote, that I read about, then I'm gonna remember there's a keyword and I can search from my account. So I can go search from at Janet Abrahamson. And I search throughout my own tweets for things that I've tweeted in the past, and then I'm more likely to be able to find them. So like, for example, digital media, um, you can fill out more, you don't need to. Um, you'll use this a lot in news. So like, oh, here are my tweets that I use the words digital media in, um, and then it'll be more easy for me to find this. You can also do that for other people's tweets. So like, um, realistically, you'll be doing that if you work in news for like politicians tweets, Donald Trump's tweets, um, that's become a really big part of um, our social media conversation. Um, so use advanced search. It's super easy to use. It's really helpful. Um, and let me get to my site. I don't know what to get into my page. Let me work my way back. One thing I didn't do there that you should do that I forgot is in your WordPress sites, make sure that you click the link, that the link will open in a new tab. So that was my bad. The reason it didn't do that. Um, so anyways, that's advanced search. Twitter lists are also super helpful. So let's take a look at my account again. I have 23 lists that I've created. Um, and I have lists for all sorts of things. This one is for students in my advanced reporting class. So if I go to my USF digital network list, you'll see I'm part of the list. So I put myself in there. But like one of my students, Beth, um, she just tweeted this. This was what I retweeted earlier. Um, so Beth is really good. She tweets a lot. Hafsa tweets a lot. Um, 
and my students in that class uh, will tweet out their stories and then it encourages everybody to go through and retweet each other and look at each other's content. Um, so that's one of the lists that I have for my advanced reporting class. Um, then let's take a look at like my other lists. Um, you can kind of see them on the side here too. So like Tampa Bay Media Jobs, um, Health, I haven't really added a lot to that. Tampa Food and Drinks, I have that one because um, in the digital network, we have a channel for food. And so I use it to help my students get story ideas. So like my advanced reporting class, for example, if their beat is food, and they're trying to do restaurant features, then they can easily scroll through this and see like what are the new restaurants coming? What are the new food festivals? What are people saying about um, different things that are happening here? And of course, there's like tons of Oscars thing here. So that's just because that was super popular last night. Um, let's see here. There's also an Explore Tampa Bay one. So that is also one of the channels on our digital network, or if you look at the Zimmerman School YouTube channel, you'll see that there's an Explore Tampa Bay. So this will help my students with story ideas. You guys are welcome to look at these lists for story ideas for yourself. This is really cool. So like students, for example, or reporters can look at these lists and say, oh, all this stuff happening, how can I turn this into a story, uh, for example. Um, I also use Twitter lists to keep me informed on important things like journalists, journalism, digital media, education, University of South Florida, and then um, storytelling. All of these things are important to me, so I use lists to kind of stay up to date on things like what's happening in journalism, for example. And I have added these members to my own list, so every time like the Pew Research Fact Tank um, tweets out, anytime Neiman Lab, for example, when they tweet, um, all of these are people or companies that I've added to my list, like the Columbian Journalism Review, because I think they tweet really what, um, helpful, uh, helpful information, Pointer, that's another, um, another organization that I added to the list. So like, if you look at my list members, these are all, organizations or Twitter profiles that I've added. And you can see, I don't follow them all. I probably should, but my ratio of followers to following, <laughs> it was a little off. So I follow, uh, I follow some of them, but you don't have to follow somebody to add them to your list. Um, when I worked in news, it was really helpful for me, like election night, for example. You can see here are all of the, the um, like the people, like John Morgan was really big um, this past election because of the medical marijuana um, initiative. So I was made sure that he was on my election list so that I could keep this up and I could follow any breaking news in that. Anytime there's breaking news, I would add a list and you can always delete them. So like Parkland shooting, for example, I would have put a Parkland, sh Parkland shooting list together so that I could be on top of all the breaking news anybody, anytime anyone said anything about the Parkland shooting. Um, so these are all lists here. To create a new list, um, you can let's start at your um, start at your profile. You can create all new lists. So um, if you go here and then you go to lists, um, you can let's see, let's see all of mine. They pop down there. Create new list here. Sorry, I do this on my phone a lot, and it looks a lot different on your phone. So not to know, on your mobile device, it's different. I barely ever use it on my um, on my computer, except for with TweetDeck, which I'll show you in a second. So to create a new list, um, you just click over here, and then you create the list name. So let's say broadcast news class, for example, um, and then I'm just going to write a description that this is for this for my class at USF or whatever. Um, it could be private, it could be public. Let's just leave it public. Now I've created a list, but I don't have any members. So um, like maybe, let's see here. Shout out one of your Twitter handles. Like Adam, what's yours? Uh, Mr. Underscore. Of course. I'm sorry, my spelling's awful. Okay, so now I found you, and I should be following you. And then um, I'm gonna add you to a list. So I'm adding you now to my broadcast news list. 
So now you're added. I don't need to add, hit apply or anything. So now you're in my list. Um, and then I can go back and add more people to the list. Um, if you're ever just like searching online and you think like you stumble upon another account that you want to add. So like, I'm not going to like, let's pretend with the Sundome. So let's say I'm on the Sundome and I want to add them. You go over here and click um, add to list. Oops. Okay. Add or remove to list. And then I could add them to the list here too. So if you ever find somebody you're like, oh, you would be great in this list of mine, you can add them. Um, you can also subscribe to other people's lists. So let's like look at lists real quick and then I'll, I'll wrap up this list part, but I just think it's super helpful. So you can see I'm a member of some lists too. Um, and they're not all by me. So like there are a bunch of random ones that I thought was, was helpful. Um, and so some of them had tons of members. So lists um, tie into TweetDeck, which is what I, I want to show you next. So TweetDeck is like my favorite thing in the world. How many of you guys use TweetDeck? How many of you have heard of TweetDeck? Like one, two, okay. So um, please do yourself a favor today, log into TweetDeck, it, it links to your Twitter account. So you don't really have to create a new thing. It just links to your, just log in with your Twitter account. I've added my lists up here. So you see these corresponded to the list that I've had before. And you can add as many lists as you want. So you scroll over to the right and you say, I have a ton of lists here. Um, you can also search, um, add lists by hashtags or um, like see my activity. Um, it's just super helpful because then I can see all of these things at once and you can retweet from inside of TweetDeck. Another really cool thing that you can do inside of TweetDeck is to schedule a post when you know that people are going to be um, on Twitter. So let's say this is my tweet and now I want to schedule it because like, let's say it's three in the morning and you're trying to work ahead. You're going on spring break and you know you're not gonna have access to Twitter, but you don't wanna be off Twitter for a week. Then you can schedule the tweet for free this way and it'll make sure that you post it at a time that's more relevant to like your target demographics. So you can schedule it this way for free. You can also use other schedulers like Hootsuite, um, but I think that costs like $30 a month or something to schedule. So this is really cool. Um, please um, take advantage of that. Um, I'm not gonna tweet that, so I'm just gonna exit out of it. But it's just really helpful. And then you can search through if you open each of these little things. You can search by users. You, there's tons of ways to categorize this information. This is particularly very helpful if you're doing breaking news. Um, so for example, we did this for the Boston Marathon bombing. When we used um, TweetDeck for the first time in my newscast, I had a, a lot of lists. So one was Boston, another was bombing, another one was terror, another one was all these things that were trending. And we put this up on a monitor in the newsroom and my reporter just went over and was like, okay, here's a relevant tweet. We used touch screens and we clicked it. And it was a way to keep the conversation going live because when we did 13 hours live straight back to back, blew through commercial breaks, you can't type fast enough to create content early enough so that there's going to be stuff in the teleprompter. So as a reporter, you need to know how to ad lib and you need to know how to use social media. So like, let's say this is a tweet, for example, if you wanted to make this bigger, you could blow it up. And then you can talk about it on air, like Ashley McBride just tweeted this from the symposium, and then you could talk about it like this. So this is a tool for on-air live reporting too. There's a million things you can do with TweetDeck. It's super powerful and helpful. So please um, take a look at TweetDeck. I think I think it's really great, um, and it also lets you like absorb absorb information really quickly. If you are interested in running Twitter for a company, like you want to do social media as a job, um, take a look at Twitter for business. Um, how do you get followers on Twitter? So there are a lot of different ways. One way is creating those lists and engaging with people. So liking their stuff, retweeting their things, and people are more likely to follow you back. Um, if you look at some of the accounts that have like millions of followers, for example, like let's say you love Buzzfeed and you are retweeting Buzzfeed stuff all the time. One way to get a lot of extra followers is to go on to Buzzfeed's Twitter and look at who um, follows them. 
So like, let's do that right now. <clears throat> All right, BuzzFeed. Okay, so let's just pretend like we're gonna go on BuzzFeed quiz. Okay, so they have 97,000 followers. Let's say I love them, I retweet this all the time. Then you click on their followers, and um, this is easier to do on your cell phone because it's like easier to just tap and scroll, but you could literally go through and go follow, 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 and follow everyone that likes the same thing that you like. And if you've recently tweeted a BuzzFeed quiz, they'll say, who is this person following me? They'll open your account and see you just retweeted a quiz, and they're like, oh, I love BuzzFeed quizzes. And then you'll get a lot of followers back. The, the thing with this trick is that you'll end up getting so many uh, people who you're following, and you want to be aware of your following to follower ratio. So like if you look at mine, it's not bad. Um, ideally, you'd like to have more followers than you are following. But, I mean, that's kind of difficult unless you're like, super celebrity. So um, I'm following 2,100 people and I have um, 2,900 followers. So um, so one of the things that you want to be careful of when you do that trick that I just showed you, very quickly it'll show that you have a ton of people that you're following. So Twitter caps it and says, hey stop, you can't follow any more people until you get more followers. Your ratio has to change. You need more people following you you can't just follow a million people unless people follow you back. So what you want to do about a week after you've done that little trick where you followed a ton of people who are interested in relevant content, let's say you follow a thousand people that day, maybe a hundred of them will follow you back. Then a week later, you go ahead and look. So who's, who's following me back? You can look at your followers uh, or the people you're following, excuse me. Look at the people you're following well, Adam doesn't follow me, so I'm going to unfollow him. <laughs> so, but for example, so okay, so this person follows me. Um, I don't know why some of these people I follow, but a lot of them follow me. So then I follow them because I like to support USF stuff. Um, but so, for example, Brad, he's the CEO of some company in Tallahassee that does TV. He follows me. Awesome. I'm going to keep following him. The Knowledge Academy. So they're not following me. I'm going to unfollow them. For example, and then you just go through and you see this this isn't this person's not following me, they're not following me, unfollow, 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 unfollow. For example, that's how you reduce your ratio or improve it. So that way you can keep following people and grow your own followers. But you want to make sure that you're doing that with people you actually have something in common with. You don't just want to follow random people because then your feed won't be as valuable to you because you'll just have a bunch of random people in your feed tweeting things that you don't care about. So like, for example, I use the BuzzFeed one, but like I would probably be more likely to go to Pointer because I follow a lot of journalism things. So I'd follow everybody who follows Pointer because they're more likely to tweet about relevant content that I'm interested in. Um, and they're more likely to actually care about what I tweet. So you wanna do that a little organically. Um, this infographic is helpful, like how to double your Twitter followers in just five minutes a day. The biggest thing is you should be tweeting. If I look at somebody, if I'm trying to hire somebody and they haven't tweeted this week, you're not getting a job. You should be tweeting every single day. If you want a job in media, you need to tweet every single day, every day. Because if you're not tweeting every day, then like, are you not reading every day? You should be reading news articles every day. You don't need to read every word in a news article, but you should at least be staying up to date on what's happening. So like, for example, if you look at like what I tweeted today, I didn't even tweet that many times today because I've been upgrading all, all morning. But for example, this is a tweet. This is a retweet. It, they're all retweets. It's okay. I took a look at this one. This one was kind of helpful. I thought, oh, this would be cool for my students. So I shared it. I did not read every single word in this article. Yes, you should, but like that's just not realistic. I read the gist of it and I said, you know what? This will be helpful for helpful for other people. So I, I tweeted it out. So every time you read something um, that you think is valuable, share it. Or like anytime somebody tags you, share it. Um, tweet. So you see how often I'm tweeting. I tweet a lot. You should also tweet a lot. If you want to tweet a lot, you'll get more followers. That'll boost your engagement online. So tweet. That's the first step. Um, you have to have a professional profile picture. That's really important. This little egg guy, 
you're not going to get followers back because people won't trust you. They'll think you're just some robot um, or like a, you know, a bot account in like some horrible like room that people are forced to tweet like thousands of times a day. So that's a real problem, actually. Buying Twitter users is a, is a real issue that now we came into with the election. Um, and so one way to spot if you're real or not is if they have this little like egg profile picture. And if you don't have a profile picture, get one. So like mine, probably too old. I should probably update this. I don't necessarily look like this anymore. I wish I did, but you know, it's been, it's been some years. So, but whatever, close enough. Uh, so it's like professional enough because I'm, you know, look normal. You see my face. It's not like a wide shot of me in a bikini or me at the gym flexing my muscles or me taking a picture of myself in the mirror. None of that. Professional headshot. That means headshot. So like this close, bust shot. Don't do a wide image. No one can see that, especially on their cell phones. So get a professional headshot. It doesn't have to be taken by professional. You guys all do this right now. You guys are all taking videos and pictures. You all have cell phones. You know how to do it. Help each other out. Get good lighting. Get good framing. Take pictures of each other um, if you need some help with this. Um, then having some kind of relevant background. This is the skyline of Tampa. If you live in Tampa, it's a relevant picture for me. So make sure that you have all of these things. That will also increase your chances of getting followers. Your bio is important. So um, like a couple of years ago, the Washington Post declared Hillary Clinton's bio was the best bio ever. So let's take a look at why. Um, she, this is how she did it. She started with wife, mom, lawyer, women and kids advocate, okay, floor, FLOTUS, U.S. Senator, Secretary of State, author, dog owner, hair icon, and then she did this pantsuit aficionado joke at herself, right? So anything you could do that's kind of funny, um, that's great. Glass ceiling cracker. So that's clever. And then to, to be determined, that's also clever, right? So lots of short things. You don't have to be like, my name is Jeanette Abrahamson and I was born in a little city in or like, that's not what the bio is for. The bio is for short, concise keywords. Um, this is a good one. So take note at, at what good people use in theirs. Um, and then this is just showing People, um, users with fewer than 1,000 tweets usually have fewer than 1,000 followers, so or 100 followers. So the more you tweet, the more likely you are to get followers. Schedule your tweets. Use things like Hootsuite, um, TweetDeck to schedule. Um, you'll see 21% more engagement when using one or two hashtags compared to using three or more. So we talked about using hashtags, but don't overdo it. Don't kill me with 10 hashtags. That's too much. One or two per tweet is the sweet spot. That's a good amount. Um, so make sure that you do use a hashtag, but don't overdo it. Connecting with all of your other um, profiles. So for example, my Twitter is embedded into the side of this website. So you can easily find my Twitter account on the side of my website. You can also find my Twitter account on my Facebook profile, on my LinkedIn, on my YouTube. Um, so make sure, and on my email signature, make sure you are sharing your Twitter um, username or your handle to increase your chances of getting um, shares. This is also a cool little tutorial little thing. Go to your LinkedIn contacts page and you can upload, upload it to your email contacts and then import and find everybody you know online. So go back and check that out. Um, getting involved is really helpful. They have Twitter chats. There are Twitter parties. There are groups for people. It's super, um, super helpful for finding people who um, have things in common with you. Um, let, I'm going to scroll past this just for the sake of time, but do take time to take a look at this because it is really helpful. Um, including links is really great. If you're going to tell me something, I want a URL to wherever the rest of the story is. Let me read more. Let me give me a reason to click. If you're promoting a video, give me the YouTube URL to the video. Make sure there's some kind of media, a picture, a GIF, a meme, something interesting and compelling that'll really drastically increase the chances of people reading it and increase the chances that they'll share your tweet. Um, you can also learn from people who are considered the best at Twitter. So for example, Anton Perklovitz, it, he's in charge of running some of the biggest 
uh, Twitter accounts in the world. So he runs at fun at Google facts. He has over uh, 9 million followers on these different accounts. He uses tools like TweetDeck, um, Buffer app, Twitter for iPhone, manages his Twitter accounts using these um, efficient tools. Um, that way you can tweet even when you're sleeping. Um, these are also some helpful ways that you can uh, promote yourself. Don't forget to put your um, Twitter handle on like a business card. And I apologize, this one wasn't embedding for some reason, which is a little bummer. So we're just going to click there and then look at what Twitter moments are. And we'll watch this quick little video um, of Twitter moments, relatively new. It launched in late 2016. And so this is what a Twitter moment is. Wow. Let's try that again. are just a different type of visual that you could use uh, to share. You'll also find Twitter moments um, on your homepage on your cell phone. If you're looking for like trending moments, those are really cool to share just because they tend to be a little bit more visual. Um, so use things like Twitter moments. Um, if you want to learn more about TweetDeck, this is a tutorial on how to use TweetDeck. Um, please take a look at this. Um, you can also follow other people who are really good at Twitter. So, for example, Lindsay Mastis is one of my old friends who um, got a reporter job at Tampa's NBC affiliate um, largely because of the number of Twitter followers she has. So this will increase your chances of getting a job. I will hire somebody with a lot of Twitter followers because for me as a company, that's fantastic. She's she can tweet stuff about our website, drive traffic. She can get more followers engaging, boost our entire company's analytics. So for example, I just updated this. Lindsay Massis now has 37,000, or excuse me, 67,000 followers on Twitter. And she's younger than me. So not like she's been building them for that long. Um, she right now is a reporter in DC. Please take a moment just to follow her on Twitter and you can use this hyperlink to take you there just to kind of understand what she does that makes her so appealing on Twitter. She gives a lot of behind the scenes things. She really lets people understand, um, you know, who she is, but also shares a lot of professional stuff. Um, does anybody have questions about Twitter? Okay, so that was the biggest one. Um, so please make sure that you're using Twitter efficiently and effectively. Um, YouTube. So YouTube is huge, right? We all use YouTube and it's not going away anytime soon. You can use YouTube to search for story ideas um, and to get information like here's an example of a search for Hur uh, Hurricane Sandy, New York, and you can filter it by upload date and then you can get user generated content this way that you could use for your newscasts. So legally, if you find something online, very important. Same thing goes for Twitter, Facebook, any other social media platform. You cannot just put it onto your newscast. You have to get approval, uh, written approval by them that you can use that. So if you find something, that, let's say the hurricane's happening um, in, in New York and you want this really cool video that somebody shot on their cell phone, just shoot them an email and say, hey, I'm writing from Tampa. Uh, NBC affiliate, I'd like your permission to use your video on my newscast. Can you please respond before 4 p.m. before my newscast airs so I know if I could use it? Then they sometimes they say yes, or sometimes they say, yeah, only if you courtesy me on air. Uh, other times they say, oh, only if you pay me 50 bucks. And then you go to your boss and they will likely say no, but sometimes they say yes, depending on how good the video is. Um, so this is a really good way to get user-generated content because everyone's posting on YouTube now. 
Um, it's also helpful to find things that are happening locally. So you can use these customized, really filtered tools to identify content that you can use online. This here is a really cool webinar to find advanced tips on YouTube. And I encourage you to watch this part one and part two, what actually happens when you upload a video to YouTube. It's just a helpful thing to understand how YouTube technically works, how they encode the videos, how you can upload an MP4 or a .mov and they all end up uh, on YouTube in the same format that you can embed on social media platforms. So take time to watch these two. It's just useful information for you. Um, now let's move on to Facebook. Facebook is trying to take on YouTube because it is shifting its focus to video. A lot of organizations are shifting to video right now. Some people in trade uh, magazines, like if you look at some journalism, uh, journalists who focus on covering journalism, some people say the video is just a fad. Um, I don't think it will go away. I think video in general will continue to boost. Maybe it gets transformed into more augmented reality, virtual reality, things like that, but video is not going away. So Facebook is trying to compete because they'd rather you upload onto their platform and have your content there because they learn a lot from you when you upload your videos too, and it drives traffic. So instead of embedding a YouTube URL into your Facebook um, timeline, they prefer that you upload to their platform. And a lot of that has to do with money. So let's take a look at this um, video that explains what's happening between Facebook and YouTube right now. Cats in the Lizard babies. And music from artists like Jesus Swift. Has been YouTube's bread and butter since 2005. Now it looks like that blood is grueling between YouTube and Facebook. Some of the social networks are filling up with videos of daredevil dogs, surfing sensations, and news clips from outlets like CNN. Overlife.com, which I'm here not familiar with, it's called And the autoplay feature on the world's biggest social network is adding up to huge numbers. Facebook says it's talking for a billion video views a day. This is a huge trend because Facebook's ultimately the platform where you discover content. And if you start discovering content on Facebook more and more, you'll not go to YouTube eventually. Facebook's already cutting into YouTube's piece of the pie. The number of YouTube videos people are sharing on Facebook at least is declining. People opt to upload their videos straight to their profile pages. And unlike the Jeff and Jay Price Tag News video, <laughs> it's probably all about the money. Facebook's adding more and more videos from advertisers that pretend to be massive revenue streams. And just this month, the company announced a revenue sharing program with video creators similar to YouTube. And Facebook trying to lure over some of YouTube's biggest stars. Mark Inclusion and Final Good. Yes. The host of a top YouTube news channel has just launched a new show, Final Judgment, exclusively on Facebook. <laughs> YouTube isn't just going to let Facebook put a ring on it, not without a fight. YouTube just had the major MTV executive in its push for original programming, and its parent company, Google, just had to knock out their news report. <laughs> Bragging that the average viewing time is now a whopping 40 minutes per visit to one mobile. The biggest threat that YouTube faces reports that Facebook is now on top of record label. If music videos end up on the big blue social networks, it could mean billions of views. Likely be Facebook saying, Samuel Burke, CNN, New York. Just another reminder to please follow Samuel Burke. He is that reporter we talked about in our other lectures who really focuses a lot on social media and tech stories. Um, so here are lots of links to help you um, really do well on Facebook. So Facebook public posts, um, here you can search public posts on Facebook, um, sites like um, who's talking up, or whotalking.com, and you can also search through, their, uh, through Google like that. Facebook um, graph search is really cool. Here are some ideas on how to do that on Facebook. Facebook groups are just taking off like 
crazy. Facebook groups are huge. That is a fantastic way to get involved. That is a really good way to network online. Um, I really encourage you to look at Facebook groups and pages um, like the page that I've talked to you guys about, like storytellers. So if you look at, um, it's right here because I go there all the time. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. This storytellers um, is just absolutely fantastic. And so you have to kind of like and, and get accepted to come in, but they post job openings, um, they post other packages. So people in news organizations will post these things here and then people will comment on it. They'll say, hey, take a look at this package I just made. What do you think? And then they'll say, hey, look at my reel. And other people will be like, awesome, you're hired. It's a really, really good way to get like niche groups looking at your content. Um, here's just an example of something I liked already. Here are tips for MMJs to shoot um, with an extra camera. Um, just lots of really good content that you can find if you use those customized groups and pages. Um, Facebook also has a really great trending section. That was fantastic for me to curate trending news when I was a news producer. So if you're looking for story ideas, I encourage you to go um, to the home page. Um, and then over on the right, you'll see things that are trending. So over here is like a list of the most trending stories on Facebook right now. Um, here's one that I noticed earlier, especially if it's local, this is important for you to understand. Um, it will be trending pretty quickly now. Um, and then if you wanna tailor it a little bit more, this is specifically for politics. This is what's trending in science and technology. This is what's trending in sports and this is what's trending in entertainment. So this is important for you to know before you go into any editorial meeting in a newsroom, you should have known, you should know what's on every single one of these pages. And oftentimes it helps me think of story ideas um, to pitch for my reporters or just to cover it in my, in my uh, newscasts. So trending section is great. Facebook Live also super huge. Um, we use it a ton in Florida because of hurricane season. So um, our TNDA shared this five tips for journalists to maximize Facebook Live. And here are some best practices you could use. I want to show you this example from my old station, WFLA. They Facebook Live a lot. So um, let's take a look at this so you can understand. So obviously like this is like kind of a boring behind the scenes part, but the you part that I want you to see, so she's talking about how the news reporters and anchors literally sleep at TV stations for days when there's a hurricane. So you have to be streaming live 24 seven and Facebook live is a great way, literally as you're getting ready to go to work, as you're um, walking over to the set, as you're putting your makeup on, you need to be communicating what's happening to people, especially with, um, with things like hurricanes, because what if their TV goes out? What if their power is out? Well, you can still use your cell phone when the TV goes out. Like if your power's out, you could still find out what's happening. So like this is an important tool um, that we used a lot at WFLA. So then this is the actual newscast and in between the newscast in commercial breaks, um, the weather girl in this case, um, Lee and then Gail Guardo will answer viewers questions. So the viewers who can't watch TV, their electricity is out, they're asking them on Facebook, hey, do you know when the power is gonna come back to my neighborhood? Do you know if we need to evacuate? Things like that and then they'll turn the camera when they are during commercial break to then talk directly to the viewers who maybe don't have access to um, TV at that time. So it is a really big public safety issue. Uh, it's a great tool to help people stay informed. Um, it's also a really good way just to um, keep people engaged and give behind the scenes looks. Like Lindsay Mathis, who I showed earlier, is really good at that. Um, here's NPR's guide. Um, again, they do a really good job of staying pretty objective. Um, this is awesome. CNN reporter Samuel Burke, he did this skydiving video. I think we watched in the other lecture. Um, and just to wrap it up, because I want to, yeah, before we get to LinkedIn, this will be the end of the part one of the lecture, and then we'll continue um, the lecture on Wednesday, and we'll pick it up from here. Um, I want to bring up one last thing that's that's very important about Facebook Live. Does everybody My remember this? We got pulled over for a busted tail wipe in the back. You guys remember this? Over, he, he, he covered, he, 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 he
Jerry took you right to the Jerry. He was trying to get out his ID and it was all out his uh, pocket. And he let someone to get home that he was reaching out a firearm and he was reaching for his wallet. And the officer just shot him in his arm. We're waiting for the this is Facebook Live. This is when Facebook Live changed the entire world and will continue changing lives for people like Philando Castile and his fiance. So this normally would have been uh, taken by cell, by police officers. So this fiance who who actually recorded this entire thing, she was detained, even though she had nothing to do. She was not guilty of any crime. The officers detained her after killing her fiance with a kid in the back and they took her cell phone, which is what they can legally do. They can take whatever they want if they're trying to detain you. And oftentimes things like videos that you recorded to use as proof of your innocence disappear somehow. That is not uncommon at all. So what Facebook Live does, it gives power to people like this to show what's really happening live on Facebook so that no matter if your cell phone gets stepped on by a police officer, that's on Facebook already. They can't erase it, it's already up there. And we've seen tons of this happen with cases like Philando Castile, all of the marches for Black Lives Matter, the journalists who have been arrested for covering things like the Black Lives Matter protest. We catch everything on Facebook Live now and it immediately goes on the internet so people know right away what's happening. Police can no longer take your video from you because it's already online. So Facebook Live is really important to understand. It's incredibly powerful. The tool just as a form of justice has just completely changed the way that our country works and I hope that uh, it continues to do so. It's being used now in courts and, and to prove what's happening. So this is one example that really changed a lot of uh, the way people looked at police shootings. Um, this one is just is chilling, but I think it's important to see. And as a news producer, it's important to know what can you air here? What do you have to blur? What do you have to legally know about using Facebook Live? But you have to use it. So this is something I fight to use. Fight to use stuff like this because it's important as the role of a journalist is to expose things like this that may otherwise have not been seen. Um, so that's the important part of, of Facebook Live, uh, more so than like this fun stuff. Um, so anyways, we're reaching the end of class. We'll pick up um, where we left off here on LinkedIn. Let me know if you guys have any questions. Otherwise, you guys are free to go.